This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. The Cannes Film Festival is the biggest film festival in the world, and I was privileged enough to go a second time just a few weeks ago. So let's get right into it. Starting with the worst thing I saw at Cannes, which was the second act directed by Quentin Dupieux. It's about a woman who brings her boyfriend to meet her father over dinner, and what happens when the boyfriend brings his friend. From what I've heard and based on this, I can see myself really liking a Dupieux film someday. But if we're speaking specifically about this one, for a film so reliant on dialogue and one takes, I found the dialogue to be uninteresting and irritating. Performances are great, I expect nothing less from the best French actors working today. And I will give the film the benefit of the doubt, I was pretty sleepy when I saw this, still pretty jet lagged. Probably not the ideal way to watch this, but hey. I was also sleepy for a handful of other films at this festival, and they did a lot more to keep me awake. Simone de la Montagne is about a young man who befriends two disabled teens, and as much as I was rooting for this based solely on how heartfelt the main performance was, it really never got the wheels off the ground. It's never outright bad, really. Everything works about it. Again, the performances are great, but very little of this if anything, was exceptional or worth writing home about. It's a nice watch and is certainly affecting at times. It has its moments, especially the beginning. I thought that was really strong. Again, mostly thanks to the lead performance by Lorenzo Faro. But honestly, this ultimately adds nothing to the subject that you haven't already seen before. The Balconettes is a horror fantasy thing directed by Noemi Merlant and starring Noemi Merlant, best known as the lead from Portrait of a Lady on Fire. It's also co-written by Celine Sciamma, who is one of my favorite filmmakers working today, which is why I'm honestly shocked at how low this is on the list. The film is about a group of women who meet the guy that's in the balcony across from them, and what happens when that encounter goes wrong. I do have to give it to Merlant. Her directing style is anything but boring. She's experimenting a lot with how to use the camera. It's sometimes bright and nauseating and, and funky and hilarious. It both has a lot of fun with the concept, whilst also taking it very seriously, which is kind of a hard thing to pull off. But I also think it's that silly and ridiculous quality that made this hard for me to latch on to. I, I could never really get on board with it. It's throwing so many ideas at the wall and some of them stick, like a certain shot in a doctor's office that I found really powerful and bold. The ending is, I'd imagine, pretty liberating, but these moments don't hit as hard as they need to because they're thrown in with like seven other ideas they throw at the wall that don't really stick. It's just very clunky. It is, it is probably the clunkiest movie I saw at the festival, and that's it's interesting because of that, but it's a mess. Wild Diamond is the directorial debut from Agath Redinger. I'm so sorry about these pronunciations. <laughs> it's about a girl who gets the opportunity to be on a hit reality show and how that offer spirals her life out of control. And I ended up enjoying this. It was the first film of the festival that I felt was pretty good. For being dangerously close to coming off generic, I thought this found its own voice pretty quickly. See, I feel like a lot of these films about younger people chasing beauty standards in the age of the internet come off very sappy or hard to take seriously. None of them really focus on the the sadness that's at the core of it. Wild Diamond does a really great job at capturing that disconnect from your inner child, that past self. It nails that feeling, it gets uncomfortably close in a way that I felt like I was watching something I wasn't supposed to be watching. And I loved this about it, but I also do wish it went just a little bit further. It's a really strong start. Rumors is directed by Guy Madden, Evan Johnson, and Galen Johnson, and it's about seven world leaders who end up in a surreal and bizarre nightmare at the G7 summit. Looking at the rest of this list, this is probably the film I laughed the most at during this festival. It's a hilarious movie. The first 20 minutes specifically are like perfect comedic filmmaking. Never a cheap joke, just non-stop pitch perfect delivery from every actor. So often comedy, specifically political satire, can come across like it's talking down on the audience. You're probably all thinking about the same guy right now. But Rumors has so much trust for the viewer, which allows it to be even more free with what jokes it decides to tell. It goes into some really strange places that shouldn't land, but they do. That said, that's kind of all this is. It's beautiful to look at. I think the production design and the lighting is, is properly strange, but I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and act like there's something more to this. I think I appreciate that about it. I think, again, when it comes to political satire, so often these films feel like they have to say something extremely important and, and make that super obvious. But Rumors is just, 
It's just kind of jokes. It's just a kind of a dumb movie. And I like that about it. We need movies like that. But for being almost two hours long, this feels like it stretches itself thin just a little bit near the end. Megalopolis. Yep, Francis Ford Coppola's latest. You know what this is. And you know what? It's not a perfect movie. I don't even know if it's a good movie, but I enjoyed watching it. And more than anything, I respect the hell out of it and I can't stop thinking about this experience. For being a script that Coppola has wanted to make for like 30 years, it does feel weirdly timely. Coming to terms with the idea of utopia, the future, what an ideal future looks like, what we can do to make that happen. I look at it less as a commentary on society at large and more as a film about filmmaking and the film industry. The tools to make something have never been more accessible, but making something meaningful that will stick in any sort of way that people will see feels strangely unattainable. I'm not really convinced that this is what this is about. It's about probably 50 other things. But when I look at it through this metacontextual lens, which admittedly has been an exhausting way to look at movies these last few years, I actually do start to admire what this is doing a little bit more. The chaos of the story within the film perfectly matches the actual production of making this, the absurdity of this being a self-funded $120 million indie film. The kinks and the cringiness, the awkward delivery, the fact that it looks unfinished. I see that less as a downside and more as a, just another piece that adds to the, the aura surrounding it. It's, it's a fascinating movie to me. There's a lot of stupid stuff, a lot of stupid stuff, especially with John Voight. Oh my goodness, Shia LaBeouf's doing drag? Don't get me wrong, it is a movie made by an old man, and that, that is made very clear in parts. But I'll get into more of this in a standalone video for the film. I have a lot more to say, but I'll leave it here and just say I, I respect it, I liked it. Don't know if it's a, a great movie though. On the complete opposite side of the spectrum is a small film called Christmas Eve in Miller's Point. It was the only film I caught in the director's Fortnite section at the festival this year, and it was a deeply refreshing movie. It's funny, on one hand, I thought this was a ridiculous film to program at a festival of mostly European audience members, as the film is so vivid and specific about capturing extremely American moments. I wondered if it was doing anything for anyone in that audience. A lot of the jokes went over people's heads, but I'm ultimately glad that they programmed it because for me specifically, after spending only a week in France, I needed this movie. Seeing something so unapologetically American, cheese and all, corny jokes, it was moving enough to bring me to tears at one point. And that's so crazy to say about such a silly little movie. Even if these weren't experiences that I was familiar with myself, I thought he put a lot of detail into these scenes, and the attention towards atmosphere over story made it super easy to understand how much this film was coming from a real place. It's the kind of independent film I rarely see nowadays, reminiscent of some of my favorites from the 70s like Nashville, where it's able to balance such a massive cast and moves from scene to scene without anything really happening, yet it's never not engaging. If you can't tell, I really enjoyed this. It's m definitely not my favorite Christmas movie in the world, but it's probably the most accurate Christmas movie I've ever seen. One of my most anticipated of the fest was Oh Canada, directed by Paul Schrader, and it tells the story of a man who dodged the draft by fleeing to Canada, who was sitting down deep into his life with a camera crew to clear up a few things. I think a key piece to understanding why I enjoyed this so much is that it's the first film Paul Schrader's put out since his Man in a Room trilogy that's that's not a part of that trilogy. A trilogy that was pretty restrictive with its style. He, he couldn't really branch out of what he set himself up for and it feels like here he's just throwing so many ideas at the wall. And if you know Schrader, when he's throwing ideas at the wall, it can get real sketchy real fast. But miraculously, a lot of these choices work. For being so stylistically scattered, it ends up being one of the most vulnerable Paul Schrader films I've seen. It's really refreshing to see him go from such guarded protagonist to someone that's so reflective and open. Someone who's actually saying too much and watching that character go through the frustrations of feeling misunderstood. Jacob Elordi as the younger version of the lead was obviously very good. I've always thought he would be amazing in a Paul Schrader movie. His wooden style of acting just fits that style perfectly. In short, I wish this got a little bit more love at the festival. Furiosa, do I, do I need to explain this one? I've already made a video about this this movie, I, in fact, I've already seen it again before making this video, but I love it. I think it's an incredible prequel and an exciting step forward for the Mad Max series. 
probably the last Mad Max movie. I still haven't come around to the VFX, to be honest. I really expected myself to like them a bit more on a rewatch, and I came away just as frustrated as I did the first time, but I do understand why he wanted it to look like that. It feels like the logical step forward. It, it's pushing the technology, which is what these films have always kind of felt like to me, but in my opinion, it just, there's, it doesn't look nearly as good as Fury Road, and that's fine, but I will say it does make for probably the most ridiculous looking Mad Max movie that I've seen. I want it focus. I also saw Kinds of Kindness, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. Similar to Paul Schrader, weirdly, this was a pretty crazy detour for Lanthimos. It's like OG Lanthimos in that it's disturbingly dry and cynical, but still a step forward in its absurdism. The film is comprised of three short stories, each getting crazier than the last, which isn't to dismiss the first one, because it starts out pretty bizarre. Listen, I love what Yorgos has been doing. Poor Things was my second favorite film of last year, but it does feel good to see him back in his weird, sicko bullshit. There's not a single crowd-pleasing aspect about this. My mom has gotten really into his movies, and I don't think she's gonna like this one, I'll be honest. It's a very unenjoyable world, which is funny to say because it's it's his first in a while that takes place in modern day, but that isn't to say the film isn't a good time, because for every miserable action, there's a really funny moment associated with it. That also happens to say something really interesting, and dare I say profound, about love and the sacrifices we make for love. Actually, as I'm thinking about this, I think this might be one of his most romantic movies, but he just gets there in a really fucked up way. Does it sound incredible? Because it is. I loved this movie. I have way more to say about it that I'll, that I'll put in a video. I will say if you don't like Yorgos Lanthimos, you should stay as far away from this as possible. It's like a marathon of his bullshit, and uh, yeah. It, you're not gonna like it. I also saw The Substance, directed by Coralie Fargier. This was my final film of the festival, not my final film on this list, and it was a crazy film to end on. It's about a woman who was once an A-list star when she was younger, who discovers a drug that creates a younger version of herself. There are a lot of T10 comparisons going on here, and I can see why. It's, it's body horror, and I like T10 better, for sure, but I will say the body horror in this makes the body horror in T10 look like Teletubbies. This goes places that are so insane and ridiculous and hilarious, I couldn't believe what I was watching. It continues to go further and further after you thought the peak was like 20 minutes ago. And that's the stuff that gets me excited. It pushes the boundaries of what I thought was possible and just gets me going, man. It is undeniably surface level in its commentary on beauty standards, aging, all that. But to me, when it comes to films like this, I don't really get enjoyment out of what it's saying. I get enjoyment out of how it's saying these things. This isn't saying anything we haven't already heard before, and the film knows that, but it wants to say it as loud as possible, as straightforward as possible, to take away the prestige people often expect or associate with movies about these subjects. There's not a whole lot of nuance here. It's just straight horror. It's like calling Joe's and the pussycat surface level. Like, no shit. I don't know. I just had so much fun with this movie. I can't wait to watch it again. I can't wait for more people to see it. I think the discourse will be exhausting, but that does not, that doesn't matter. It's a great movie. And my favorite film of the festival was Bird, directed by Andrea Arnold. This is a movie about a girl living in northern Kent with her father, Bug, who one day meets a peculiar fellow named Bird. I will come clean, this is my first Andrea Arnold movie. I know. But I love her style. She has a real tenderness to how she captures these brutal environments. I think her use of music is so touching. It, it shouldn't work as well as it does, but it just feels like you're entering another part of these characters' worlds. Part of that can be owed to Robbie Ryan's gorgeous 16mm cinematography here. It's without a doubt the best looking film I saw at the festival, which is saying a lot. It added such an appealing yet like rough around the edges texture to the film that really matched the story. And every performance here is a home run in my opinion. Barry Keoghan specifically does something I haven't really seen him do before. It's a real comforting character, yet it's still very intense. Franz Rogowski, obviously incredible, just, just the best. 
just the best. If there is anything the film succeeds at, and there's a lot that it succeeds at, I would say what I really hooked onto was just how vivid and colorful she's able to paint the environment. Both the ugly sides and the beautiful sides are portrayed with such detail, which is only worth mentioning because of how well that realism complements the pops of surrealism here and there. There's a specific moment that I, there's no way I'm gonna spoil, but it's like incredible. It comes out of nowhere, but it works insanely well. It reminds me of childhood in that way, just the blend of fantasy and realism and, and how bright and scary and big the world feels. This film nails that. For all those reasons and more, it's the best film I saw at the festival. One of the best things I've seen this year. Thanks so much for watching this video and for supporting me. You're the reason I get to go on these trips. It's such an honor and a privilege. So thank you, seriously, from the bottom of my heart. Go watch these movies and form your own opinions. And before you head out, I want to thank this week's sponsor, Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. On Squarespace, you can start your own personalized website with their new guided design system, Squarespace Blueprint, which allows you to choose from professionally curated layout and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up, tailored to your brand or business, and optimized for every device. They make it super easy to launch that website and get discovered fast with their integrated, optimized SEO tools so that you show up more often to more people and grow the way you want. If you're looking to showcase your portfolio in a really beautiful way, you gotta check out their video collections feature, which allows you to upload video content, organize your video library, and showcase your content on beautiful video pages. And perhaps the best part about Squarespace is their visual design tools, which allow you to grow credibility and engage visitors with an unrivaled suite of visual design effects built in and ready to go on any Squarespace website. They have everything you need to create your own unique aesthetic. You can go to squarespace.com to start your free trial, and when you're ready to launch that beautiful website, go to squarespace.com slash karsten to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.